Next, on Viewpoint, 36 years in public office, 25 campaigns, 13 years as Lieutenant Governor, 6 as U.S. Congressman, 12 as Governor. Historians will find it difficult not to put Butch Otter among the state's all-time most prominent and influential politicians. But as he prepares to walk out of the State House, don't think for a minute we've seen the last of this Idaho icon. In our final sit-down interview before he leaves office at the end of the year, he talks about the past, the present, and the future for him and the state that he has led for the past 12 years. Governor Clement Leroy Butch Otter, next on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Hello and welcome to Viewpoint. He was Idaho's cowboy governor for a dozen years, a position he says his previous life as president of the Simplot Corporation while working for the legendary potato magnate J.R. Simplot prepared him for. His tenure as Idaho's CEO included a historic recession, a tough line on wolf management, a strong push for education reform, and two executions. I began our final in-office interview by asking the 76-year-old Idaho native if the rocking chair on his front porch is where we'll see him next. That isn't going to happen. It's not? That isn't going to happen. No, I'll tell you, I've got, uh, I've got pretty good genes. My mother died two years ago at 101. And uh, she was active right up until about four days before she passed. And uh, I intend to do the same thing in the same way. I'm going to stay active, whether it's, uh, whether it's something that, uh, that uh, takes me around the world or takes me on a mission. Uh, Miss Laurie and I discussed uh, several times whether or not we would, we would go through the process and go on a mission for our Catholic Church. And uh, we've got some missions, mostly in the, in the Latin American or South American area. Uh, but we've got some pretty good missions, and I think I could be helpful there for a while, maybe. Uh, I've, I think I'm going to have lots of opportunities, and I'm going to use my time. I'm not going to spend my time trying to prolong everything, as Jack London said. Uh, you know, I want to go out as a meteor, uh, not a... Not a burnt flame. Your faith and your Catholicism really has been a fire and a flame for you in this job, hasn't it? It has. My, uh, my dad used to say that, that, and you could say this about a lot of religions, I'm sure, but he said, you know, Butch, the, the Catholic religion is the hardest to live by, but it's the best to die in. And so that's my goal. It has been my goal. In fact, I, I don't know if a lot of people know this. You probably know it because of the time we've known each other. But my first three semesters in college after high school, I graduated from what is now Bishop Kelly, St. Teresa's Day. I was at a uh, Benedictine monastery in uh, Lacey, Washington, St. Martin's Abbey. You wanted to be a priest. Uh, I, was, I was, well, my dad wanted me to be a priest. <laughs> and I was the only one that really went on to college in my family. And, uh, but, and, you know, my dad uh, would support that. Otherwise, he, uh, he thought I ought to become a, 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 an apprentice something. He was a journeyman electrician. And my other brothers did become an apprentice of something and then became uh, quite successful each in their own right. But uh, my story is I left the monastery when they told me I couldn't be pope. <laughs> That's my story, Mark, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Well, you, you referred to your family. You're the sixth of nine children, four boys, five girls. Um, you were at Simplot, started, as I recall, picking potatoes and shoveling ended up potatoes. shoveling potatoes. Forking potatoes, we call them. And, and how does somebody go from shoveling potatoes at Simplot to becoming the president of Simplot International? Well, uh, that's an interesting story, how I started shoveling potatoes, because Mr. Simplot came over to the house one Sunday shortly after uh, his daughter and I were first married, and he said, Butch, and I was going to the College of Idaho and playing football there and, and uh, uh, taking political science. I was, it was pre-law, really. I was going to be 
become a lawyer. And so Mr. Simplot said, Butch, I want you to go out here and learn how to run that plant and run that plant. And I said, okay. So the next day I went out there, saw Leon Jones and Frank Gimlin. And I said, Mr. Simplot sent me out here to run this plant. And they said, okay. And so they took me out into the potato cellar. And they said, you shovel those potatoes into, into that water trough. And if you don't, the plant doesn't run. So you're running the plant. Fortunately, I only got to run the plant for about three months. <laughs> But then, over the next uh, few years, for, with the exception of the time that I was on active duty in the Army, uh, I worked my way all through the plant. I worked almost every workstation going through that plant until 1973, uh, when I became uh, the Vice President of Administration for just the Food Division. Right. So you can't say, I married the boss's daughter and next thing you know I'm President. Didn't go down like that. Well, I thought it was going to go that way when he said, go out here and run this plant. <laughs> but uh, he, his idea of, uh, and he was great. He, he was a, I, I've had some wonderful mentors in my life, besides my own father uh, and mother. Uh, but uh, the Jack Simplots and the Joe Albertsons and the, and the Phil Batts and the Cecil Andruses, the folks that I got to know and, and work with, sometimes on a daily basis, uh, had really, really changed, uh, directed, I guess I should say, uh, my life. And uh, I'm grateful for every one of them, you know, they're all gone now. Well, Phil isn't, right. bless his heart, yeah. uh, but uh, I've, I've been richly blessed by the people I've known and the people I've gotten to work with and the people that took an interest in me and said, you know, we'd like, to, we'd like you to do this and we'd like you to do that. How, how did the experience that you had as the Simplot International President, traveling around to over 80 countries, how did that set you up for eventually this position? Well, actually that happened as a result of McDonald's, uh, McDonald's hamburger stands, deciding to go more worldwide. And they wanted the same products uh, on the Glockenspiel in Munich, Germany, that you had just off the loop in Chicago, Illinois, that you had in San Diego when, when Ray Kroc actually uh, started McDonald's. And uh, they wanted that same quality. Uh, and so their standards for whether it was the hamburger or the french fries or whatever were the same worldwide and that's what they wanted. And so that gave us an opportunity because Simplot Company was the one that invented the back fry. Uh, the 930 seconds by 930 seconds, 64 percent AVD uh, French fry, and uh, a lot of people have tried to copy it. In fact, once the once the patent ran out, why uh, McDonald's needed a minimum supplier and a maximum supplier, and Ray Kroc and Jack Simplot were great friends and spent a lot of time together. And uh, Ray gave the company at that time the bulk of the business. But I remember the first sale, seven million pounds. And who was that to? That was to Ray Kroc. Here to in America. His, his oh yeah, it here. was out of the Caldwell plant. And uh, Ray, Ray had made a comment one time that he would never buy a frozen French fry. Uh, but we didn't really enjoy the storage technology for raw potatoes that we do today. And so usually if they were dug in September or October, by March and April, they were starting to get uh, a little, they were starting to shrink. Uh, they were starting to lose the quality that they wanted. And so uh, when he came in and they had the blind test, I was in the research kitchens watching this, and he went around to all the plates and they had their folks come in and, and, and make some French fries from raw potatoes. And then we had our frozen French fries, but they were a blind test. You didn't know which was which. And when they picked the three that he liked the best, all three of them were frozen french fries. Oh, wow. So he did buy a frozen french fry. Woo! First in line! You don't have to wait for Furniture Row's Black Friday VIP sale. Out? Nope. Shop today for huge savings store-wide. Plus five years no interest and no down payment. And best of all, the more you buy, the more you save. No limit or get free gifts when you spend $29.99 or more. I got a tent. It really is a great tent. The Black Friday VIP sale, only at Furniture Row. 
It's the week of Thanksgiving. It's finally here. Time to ring in the season with tradition and cheer. Come follow the music to see the delights of the holiday's finest all sparkling in lights. Of branches so full, it's a feast for the eyes. Around every corner, it's another surprise. Bring your wishes for Santa, the true Mr. Claus, and know that you're giving to help a great cause. The whole Treasure Valley treasures moments like these. It's time for St. Alphonse's Festival of Trees. At your neighborhood Fred Meyer, you'll find the freshest produce yet, priced right. Plus everything else you need to celebrate the season deliciously. That's how you holiday. Fueling your sleigh for less. That's how you holiday. Retailers make big bucks on accessories and extended warranties. Research what you really need. Accessories can be cheaper online. And tomorrow, Black Friday's best betting bargains. The Deal Boss. Weekdays on today's Morning News. KTVB and the Downtown Boise Association present Christmas in the City with the Downtown Boise Tree Lighting. Enjoy music and carols, friends, and family with this sparkling holiday tradition November 23rd. Visit the community page at ktvb.com. Welcome back to our one-on-one -on -one sit down with Governor Butch Otter as he prepares to leave public office after serving for nearly four decades at the state and federal levels. I asked him to take us back to his first campaign, the first of 25, when he told his then father-in-law and boss, J.R. Simplot, that he wanted to represent Canyon County at the State House. When I first ran, that was in 72, and that was for a seat representing Canyon County in the state legislature in the, in the House of Representatives. And I served two terms and, and it was kind of frustrating for me. At the company, an idea at lunch could be company policy at one o'clock. Things don't move that fast at the state. I would like to say, you know, if I go to lunch and we have a good idea at lunch that it could become state policy, public policy at one o'clock. It doesn't happen quite that fast. So, so how, explain to me then, how you decide that it goes from frustrating to really rewarding to leave this job at Simplot. You were set up at Simplot. Yeah. You could retire at the age of 55, a multi-millionaire with all your stock options. How does a guy go from frustrated at the state house, at the state level, to I want to be a politician for the rest of my life? I didn't make that decision because being in the state legislature was kind of a part-time job. So I could also fulfill my duties uh, at Simplot Company for the most, uh, for the most part uh, when I was in the House of Representatives. Because you met January, February, sure. maybe go into March or uh, mm -hmm. rarely into April. So d during that time, uh, we weren't harvesting, we weren't planting, we weren't, we weren't uh, really that active. You had a lot of office work. And so that I could do, whether at my desk in the House of Representatives or at my desk at the, at the Simplot headquarters. Uh, when I ran for Lieutenant Governor, that's also a part-time job. Right. And so, uh, because I serve as the President of the Senate, so when the legislature's in, in session, I'm serving as the President of the Senate, but I'm available. Uh, and so, uh, Mr. Simplot and the company uh, were very generous with that time as well. And so when I retired, I was still lieutenant governor uh, in 92 when I retired from the company. Uh, and that's when I probably went into more of a full-time mode. But I didn't make a decision as I want this career instead of this career uh, until 98 uh, when my good friend Mike Simpson ran for the United States Congress and would come back with with great tales about what a tremendous experience it is. And uh, he told me something one day that I didn't realize. He said, you know, Butch, you can become president of the United States by appointment. You can become, Jer ask Jerry Ford. The only people that ever elected Jerry Ford was in the fifth district of Michigan. Uh, you can become a United States senator. In fact, if something happened to a senator today, the governor appoints uh, that the, the, the reappointment or the appointment uh, for the term that the person who 
absent the office, didn't fill out. But there's only one way you can reach the United States House of Representatives, and that's by the consent of the governor. So if something would happen to a representative today, the governor has to call a special election. So only by the consent of, and, and the will of the people you represent is the only way you can get to the United States House of Representatives. And it's a, it's a terrific honor. And you know, I studied politics, uh, and I probably should have known that uh, in, in my studies, but I didn't realize uh, that it was that it was that difficult to get to the House of Representatives. Yeah. And so that's the first time I had a full-time uh, job is when I, in 2000, in the Millennium class, uh, I went to the United States Congress representing the first district of Idaho in, uh, in uh, 2001. But you told me after your first term, after two years, you were kind of disenchanted. You wanted to come home. Yeah, you weren't getting anything done. You weren't, uh, you know, the same frustration that I kind of felt in the Idaho House that uh, you got to remember, I'm coming out of the business world where I say an idea at lunch, company policy at one o'clock. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't work that way in, in politics. And I lack the patience. Uh, but I would tell you, uh, getting into this office, uh, as I said before, I had a lot of mentors and a lot of folks that gave me a lot of great ideas. But getting into this office, when I was in the House of Representatives in Idaho, I was one of 70. When I was in the United States Congress, I was one of 435. When you're sitting in this office, you're a majority of one. This is where, as Truman said, the buck stops. And so in establishing public policy, uh, in, you once again have to go back. And I don't, I don't know of very many bills that I ever signed that I didn't go to the person that carried the bill on the floor of either the House or the Senate, or that authored the bill, and said, what, what, what are we trying to accomplish here? What are we doing here? Because you could read the bill, and that's why there's always legislative intent in the back of a bill, because in real simple language that I can understand, uh, they would explain, this is what our, the intent is, and this is what it's gonna cost. So it had a financial purpose, and it had a legislative intent purpose. So. Uh, where, I'm, where I'm going is that, uh, you know, I don't know of a profession, and I've been in the business world, and I've been in the international world, and I've been in the political world, and uh, probably uh, the most uh, international interest that I had was when I served for President Reagan between 1982 and 1985 on the Presidential Task Force on International Private Enterprise. When you think about the last 12 years, um, the positives, there have been so many, as I told you, but there have been some shortcomings that I know may have kept you up at night, have they? Yeah, uh, there, there were some frustrating uh, times, especially with, uh, especially, well, you mentioned one of them, highway funding. Uh, we got 7,000 miles of, of lane miles of, of highway in the state of Idaho. Uh, we got 4,000, 4,500 bridges in the state of Idaho. Many of those are reaching their useful and designed life. And I always took the position that, that deferred maintenance is deficit spending. And that's why I would try to convince my conservative friends in the legislature that if we had add a little bit to gas tax, if we'd add a little bit to the, uh, which should be a self-funded agency, the ones that are using the highway ought to pay for the highways. Uh, and it wasn't until the last couple of years that we actually took money out of sales tax and out of income tax and put that into highways. We did that with, uh, with a bill that would balance the budget. And so if we had, if we had uh, more money coming in than we had anticipated, half of that money would then go for the highways. But uh, you know, the same, the same, some of the same folks that would complain about a, a $21 trillion, $21.5 trillion uh, deficit in uh, debt in Washington, D.C., and an annual deficit of uh, maybe, maybe billions of dollars uh, were, the, were the same ones that, that didn't see that deferred maintenance was also deficit spending, that if you don't fix the roof, uh, and eventually that roof starts leaking, 
and destroying what's ever inside that building, uh, now you're going to have to replace the whole building. Raul Labrador comes to mind. You butted heads with him on this issue. I did. And, and you know, I, I know that those folks who took an oath that they would never raise taxes were sincere. You came out publicly, endorsed Prop 2. I'm assuming you're going to be signing that soon, before you leave. Oh, no, I don't have to sign it. The people, have, the people have already voted. It's done. And they voted 61, almost 62 percent right. in favor of it. And so they are exercising their rights under the First Amendment, uh, the, the right of petitioning your government. And uh, so and there's five freedoms in the First Amendment, and that's number five. Uh, but I, I don't have anything. I can't veto it. And it doesn't require my signature. Most people are saying you're handing the baton off to Brad Little uh, ahead in the race. You're leading the race. Uh, you're handing him a house that's pretty well battened down, tightened up, uh, in good shape. Um, there's not a lot for him to do from here, but oh, to yes, take what you've done yeah. to the next level. Is that accurate? No. There's a lot to be done. RCWilly.com. Shop hundreds of furniture styles available for immediate in-store pickup or delivery. If you're enrolling in Medicare Part D for 2019, we're here to help make it easier, no matter which plan you choose. You may save money with preferred pharmacy pricing on most major Medicare Part D plans, with low co-pays too. Plus, Fred Meyer offers you health and nutrition support with all the delicious food you need. So remember, if you're choosing a new Medicare Part D plan, we've got you covered. Visit us in-store or online today. Is your loved one receiving the care they deserve? Now there's a new option. Discover personalized care at Cascadia of Nampa and Boise, bridging the gap between hospital and home. From full-time nursing to short-term rehabilitation, our professional team will provide the best care your loved one needs. Medicaid, Medicare, and private pay accepted. Welcoming new residents now. Cascadia of Nampa and Boise. Call today. For centuries, we, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, have honored our resources as good stewards and our region as good neighbors. We've built a world-class casino resort hotel that supports hundreds of jobs, funds health care and other services, and has generated more than $33 million for education. Because we've been an integral part of this land for generations, and we will be for generations to come. With carpet this comfortable, why move? Shop hundreds of carpet colors and styles today at RC Willie. As Governor Butch Otter begins his exit from office, he told me there is much for the next administration to do. The infrastructure, health care, student success rates, growth management, and much more. He said his mantra, focus on the necessary, not the nice, has served the state well under his watch, and he wrapped up our interview with an emphatic tone of optimism for the current direction and future of Idaho. I'm bullish uh, on Idaho, and I'm very optimistic. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, because of what happened in the last election. And Brad's been at my side for 10 of the 12 years. Uh, I had a unique opportunity, a rich opportunity that a lot of governors don't get, and that is to appoint my own lieutenant governor. I interviewed 29 people uh, that, that did, thought that they wanted to be a lieutenant governor, and for one reason or another, uh, Brad rose to the top of that. So when I appointed my own lieutenant governor, I was looking for somebody that could be a good partner and could, could go on into the future. And so uh, the reason I'm optimistic is, is several. This year's budget was right at $3.8 billion. So we've recovered. We're at 2.7% unemployment. Uh, we've created two community colleges in Idaho. Those are portals for workforce development. 
Uh, we've created a medical school in Idaho. We've paid a lot of attention to workforce development in Idaho. And Brad's been right there and part of that, and so is Sherry. And so I'm, I'm very optimistic because a, a well-educated citizenry, I look at it in, in, in three ways. Number one, uh, as every parent, which what my parents wanted for me and my brothers and sisters, uh, was to have a better life than what they had. And in order to experience that better life and take every opportunity for that, you gotta have good education. You gotta be well educated. Uh, the second the thing that I look at is the workforce development. Business needs smart people creating the next generation of their products, the next generation of whatever it is we make or build or add value to in Idaho. Uh, they've, gotta, they've gotta have smart people doing that. And, uh, and education is, is how that happens. So sitting around in maybe the second grade or maybe, the, maybe a senior in high school or in college today is the person that's gonna invent the next french fry, uh, the next process for sugar beets, uh, the next lumber mill, uh, robot, uh, all of those kinds of things. So uh, I, think, I think Idaho's gonna be in great shape with the folks that I leave behind. Plus. Uh, we've left, uh, we're going to leave with about 500 million in savings. So they've got a little buffer against the things that we went through in 8, 9, and 10. Uh, and they've got, a, they've got a good model to look at. Focus on necessary. I asked the singing governor if he would leave us with a song from his deep collection of favorites. He grabbed a guitar and chose a John Denver song called Welcome to My Morning with the lyrics, Welcome to my morning, welcome to my day, I'm the one responsible, I made it just this way, an appropriate way to wrap this Butch Otter retrospective. Thanks for watching. Welcome to my morning, welcome to my day, I'm the one responsible, I made it just this way. Welcome to my happiness, you know it makes me smile. Pleases me to have you here for just a little while. Welcome to my evening, the closing of my day. I could try a million times, never find a better way. To tell you that I love you, all the songs I play, are to thank you for allowing me inside your lovely day. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> I could have done a little better than that with my own guitar. <laughs>